like we have been discussing before now, and we have looked at various aspects of development and how the whole idea of development education has come into so much prominence within the confines of third world politics, economics, and administration. There is no need to overemphasize the fact that the whole idea is built around having a functional system that third world countries can benefit from. And in line with that, we have looked at various aspects and various theories that have given various explanations as to how developed countries are where they are and various explanations and various scholarly postulations as to why poverty and the development reigns or ravages in other parts of the world, which uh, third world countries, particularly of African descent, have been uh, uh, disadvantagedly uh, positioned in that direction. So we also understand that so much has to be done to attain development. In the last class, we looked at various aspects of how underdevelopment can be transformed into development in this part of the world. The deliberate efforts that must be put in place to attain development. And we saw clearly that so many ideas must come to play, ranging from various reforms to various uh, legislative uh, uh, agendas and aspects that will trigger development. And in the last class, we laid the emphasis on the civil service as a tool of development in third world countries, with particular emphasis on Nigeria. And we saw that in as much as the civil service we have today is inherited, various reforms have taken place to restructure it and reposition it in the pursuit of development. And beyond the civil service also, there's the aspect of using legislation as a tool in the pursuit of development. We saw the uh, Udoji Commission, the Okibo Commission, and so many other reforms that took place within the civil service to restructure it. Because that appears to be the largest industry we have in third world countries, particularly in Nigeria. And this idea is premised on the fact that if we have a functional civil service, it will be easy to put into practice government policies and programs that would orchestrate development and it will be a deliberate measure to attain development using the instrumentality of the civil service. So in line with all that, in today's lecture, our emphasis will be on another aspect that can be used in the pursuit of development, which is the angle of development planning. You know, like we know it before now, Nigeria has had pre-independence and post-independence development plans. And the whole idea is to target specific areas or specific sectors of the economy that can be used in the pursuit of development. As we make progress, you would see that there are development plans that targeted agriculture, some targeted industrialization, others targeted even a vibrant welfare, a, a civil service a system, others targeted em em employment, and so many other areas that the country put in deliberate measures to pursue the issues of development. So in today's lecture, our emphasis would be on the various development plans, the high points of those development plans, the benefits that the country derived from them, and the successive plans that sought to drive the issues of industrialization and issues of overall development of the society. So like we said here, <clears throat> Nigeria, like many other countries, have always had development plans. They were more pronounced during the early years of independence up to the 90s. However, they are still development plans, but not as prominent in development literature as they used to be. This unit deals with the 10-year plan of development and welfare for Nigeria, 1946 to 1956, and the criticism that greeted the plan. Let me also pause here and quickly mention that beyond these development plans or prior to these development plans, we have had even colonial efforts towards the attainment of development. We saw in the various constitutional development ranging from the Clifford Constitution of 1922 to the Little Little Constitution to the McPherson Constitution and the Independent Constitution as well. And these are all efforts put in place to have a working system that reflects the nature and character of our own society. 
that was put in place deliberately by these colonial masters as a measure to pursue development and to ensure that we have a society that is built or modeled along the lines of development that is found in these Western countries. So this constitutional effort is also a recognizable aspect in the pursuit of development within these third world countries. And Nigeria is the perspective that we are looking at. So at the end of this uh, uh, lecture, it is expected that you should be able to understand what development plans are, to know the high points of the various development plans that have been put in place pre-independence and post-independence, mm -hmm. and the efforts by successive regimes, be it military and democratic uh, uh, government, in the pursuit of development, the structural uh, arrangements that was embedded in these development plans, ranging from the various positions, be it by the colonial masters to Nigerians uh, and indigenous of Nigeria in carrying out various aspects in the pursuit of development. So historically, we can say that in February 1946, the first attempt for incorporating a plan was adopted by the council. It derived from a development in 1940 when the Colonial Development and Welfare Act was passed in Britain with the purpose of promoting social betterment of the colonies. Following the adoption of the legislation incorporating the plan, a colonial economic advisory committee with a membership that included economists such as Lionel Robbins, Evans Dobbin, and Northland, Hubert Henderson, and ex-colonial administrators such as the former governor general of Nigeria, Sad Bernard Bodilon, was established. The controversy that created the committee over its status, role, and competence to discuss or initiate discussions of such matter as strategies for agricultural development, industrial development, colonial public debt, division of taxation between the colonies and the United Kingdom, and the bulk purchase arrangement made the enactment of a new colonial development and welfare act imperative. So what this statement is trying to say is that these colonial uh, uh, masters looked or took an in-depth analysis of the Nigerian situation and its peculiarity and came up with ideas of how to pursue development. They were the first to lay a development plan for Nigeria, even though upon independence, the various administrations that we have witnessed have put in various development plans up to date. However, the relevance and the pronouncement of this post-independence, pre and that they were able to pursue development in a long-term manner. They had very concise development agenda that revolved within four, five years plan and a whole lot of that. In, in fact, we have even seen 10 years development plan. The very first development plan started from the 1940s, 1946, and ended in 1956. And within that period, we saw growth of the economy from different perspectives. Like we have seen here, the high points of this first development plan revolved around agriculture, industrial development, the issue of colonial public debt, division of taxation between the colonies and the United Kingdom, and so many other aspects. Remember also, borrowing from the last class, that the idea of having a functional administrative system built around the civil service had already taken place before these development plans were put in place. In fact, as we make progress, you will see that the civil service played a very prominent role in ensuring that this development plan saw to the development of this uh, 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 part of the world. So as we also make progress, you will be finding very high points of these various development plans. Some uh, uh, used, I used red colors, others blue colors for you to see both the advantages and strategies of these development plans. So in terms of its structuralization, the new Colonial Development and Welfare Act of 1945 restricted the role of the advisory committee to the steady inflow of development plans from the colonies without imposing solutions on them. As far as Nigeria was concerned, its size detected that some central organization be established for overall coordination, control of finances, and the preparation of major policies. So you can see that these development plans had all the ideas embedded in them, which ranges from overall coordination of how the activities of government are to be carried out, the issues of finances, both revenues and expenditure, and how they can be deployed into realizing the objectives of development and the development of critical sectors of the economy, and also, the preparation of major policies that will target specific areas and boost them 
to meet development agenda. So these colonial masters, in as much as their role of uh, in terms of exploitation, seem to have a negative effect on the country, it also laid the first foundation upon which Nigeria thrived into independence and uh, of, upon which development ideas kick-started within the country. An advisory committee on economic development and social committee was established in the colonial office, but its membership was restricted to officials. Also, a central development board consisting of the development secretary, the three chief commissioners for the northern, western, and eastern provinces, the commissioner of the colony, the financial secretary to the look of the government, and the director of public works was established in the secretariat in Lagos. Remember in the last class, we saw how the McPherson's constitution of 1951 positioned Nigeria for a, a regional government. And this development agenda also re-emphasized that idea by pursuing development on a regional basis as well. In as much as there was a plan to have Nigeria as a country upon independence, the earliest arrangement was on regional a, a, a government and this regional of government had their various ideas and agenda in the pursuit of development in these various regions. The function of the board was to lay down planning principles and policies, priorities and funding of development year by year and between one part of the country and another. In the provinces and the colony, the chief commissioner established area development committees made up in each case of the resident and representative of departments, the area committees were expected to evaluate proposals from the provinces prior to their submission to the Central Development Board. Each province, there were 24 of them, also had a provincial development committee consisting of the residents as chairman, representatives of the departments, and some unofficial members. Remember in the last class, we made mention that upon the introduction of elective principle into the arrangement that propelled Nigeria into, depend into independence. We saw that we had official and non-official members of various uh, uh, legislation or legislative bodies within the country. And remember that the Clifford Constitution was the first constitution that made arrangement for this elective principle and made provisions for official and unofficial members. So they all constituted the council that brought about this first development plan that existed between 1946, even into independence. And the whole idea was built around having a vibrant economic arrangement that development can be pursued within that framework. So their emphasis focused on even the civil service in itself, other aspects of agriculture, industrialization, having a financial, a stable financial system, and a whole lot of others with various structural arrangement built around both members of the civil service, members of the political class, members of uh, other aspects of government that all saw the need to pursue development within a central framework. So the role of this committee was to operate local schemes to be sent to the area development committee. The arrangement according to Okigo would have been to no avail if there had been no organization at the apex to make the necessary decision. The answer was that the governor, the governor council in Lagos, who took the necessary decision on the spot, and the secretary of state for the colonies in the colonial office, who had the power to approve or reject proposals, and also since the bulk of the finance was to come directly from or was channeled through the colonial office, the approval or sanction of the secretary of the state became, in the final analysis, the ultimate authority and represented British government policy. Simultaneously, decisions that were to apply to a particular colony had to be given local legal backing. In Nigeria, they were therefore referred to the Legislative Council, in which at that time, British official members predominated over Nigerian members who were either elected as in the colony or appointed as in the protectorate. The 10-year plan of development and welfare in Nigeria, 1946-1956, had therefore to be approved by the Legislative Council in order to have the necessary legal validity and legitimacy. The philosophy underlying the plan was fully articulated in a document published in 1954 entitled Pre Preliminary Statement on Development in Nigeria. What this statement is simply trying to say is that the Council had its internal structure that was built around both official members and appointed members. And remember, 
like in the civil service, that the positions, the high ranking positions was reserved for the colonialists or the British colonial masters. We also had a government system or a legislative system that had the British dominating the assembly as at that time. So Nigerians occupied basically very limited roles within this development agenda that was put in place as at that time. So the need for development or for planning was defined by the uneven progress of the country up to that time. So this idea of coming up with this development plan put into consideration the regionalization of the country and saw that there was the need to pursue development and even development arrangement. Hence, this comprehensive development plan that factored into its agenda, the development levels within the northern region, the, the western region, and the eastern region as at that time. So the idea was to propel development across boards. It had become apparent, therefore, that coordinated plans should be formulated and executed to improve the standard of health, education, transport, and other similar services. So you can see that the high points of this development plan was built around having a vibrant health system and education arrangement, even though it can be argued that this was basically put in place to further the exploitation of the, of, of, of the colony. However, they marked an effort that was put in place in the pursuit of development. So the plan drew deeply on the philosophical attitudes of the time in particular, socialist doctrines that sprang from the triumph of the Labour Party in Britain after two decades in the shadows, the preoccupation with welfare and social development in Britain was carried forward to the colonies and translated into concrete form in the plan. Under the plan, a total planned expenditure of about 110 million for a period of 10 years was envisaged, with 46 million of the amounts to be met with funds provided under the Colonial Development and Welfare Act. So, like we have said before now, that the whole idea of this course, development administration, is premised on understanding the centrality of using government as an instrument in the pursuit of development. And that we saw that using the government idea or agenda of commanding the critical sectors of the economy was successful in the Soviet Union or in the socialist republics of various countries of that time and that the welfare system ensured an egalitarian society where people got according to their needs and contributed to a common cause. Side by side, the free market economy, that the commanding heights of the economy was left in the hands of private individuals and the motive was for profit maximization. And we saw that within that period of time, the centrally planned economies that allowed the government or used the government as an instrument of development fared better than when the forces of demand and supply decided who got what, when, and how. So upon independence, this idea of having development plan reflected the government idea of using government resources and government uh, uh, machineries, be it human and material resources, to be deployed in the pursuit of development. So this whole idea of the first development plan reflected that socialist arrangement of having the government deciding the various aspects of development that should be pursued within the country. So it was not left in the hands of private individuals because it would have been a lopsided government ar development arrangement. So this idea of having central development plan was to propel even development of the country that was gotten upon in the so like you, as, as you can see, uh, marked in red, the philosophical arrangement embedded in this development plan was premised on to boost a, a health sector development, an educational arrangement, a transport system that would now ensure rapid development upon independence. So they were not left in the hands of private individuals alone. So the plan, however, did not run its full term because by 1950, the inappropriateness of charting development over a period as long as 10 years in a country, experiencing rapid structural changes had become evident. In other words, the plan of 1946-1956 was faced with a lot of crisis owing to the fact that first, its scope was too broad, its time frame was too, too, too long, and it experienced a lot of challenges within that uh, period of time. The estimated cost of projects over a 10-year period 
could be at best an educated guesswork. This was readily appreciated in the formulation of the plan that the cost figures were only tentative and will be subject to further revision in the light of new information, knowledge, and prospects for financing. Also, the data required for effective planning were grossly inefficient. So if you look at this statement now, you will now find the pitfalls that existed within the development plan. First, it was too long a time. And secondly, due to the, the evolutionary a, a development that was experienced in various parts of the world, it would have rendered any development plan of that a, a, a time frame obsolete. And that issues of information, knowledge, and prospect for financing would have been a challenge within this uh, arrangement. Excuse me, please. So this development plan had a lot of challenges that necessitated an improvement or at best an, an abrupt end of the ideas that were embedded in the development uh, plan. So having said that, it is worthy of note that however the challenges that was faced that period, that earliest development plan laid the framework for subsequent development plans. As we make progress and as you read through, you will see the structuralization that existed within the successive development plans. Therefore, a decision was taken to break the plan into two five-year periods, 1946 to 1951 and 1951 to 1956. The plan had been criticized for many reasons. For overall economic targets. The criticism contained a large element of truth. It was valid in the sense that there were no overall economic targets in terms of macroeconomic variables, readily quantifiable uh, 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 narratives against which the performance of the plan could be measured. The plan also was comprehensive as it was more of a list of projects, the selection and preparation of which did not take into account the participation of the people being planned for. It completely neglected major branches of activity, for example, industry, and concentrated on social services, agriculture, and communications. One major error which was frequently permitted or committed, the authors of the National Development Plan and continued, was that entirely new unrelated projects were readily substituted for original programs without proper analysis and coordinations with other projects. So beyond the ones that we have mentioned that, first, the span was too broad, the scope was too broad, the lifespan of it was too long, and that the evolving nature of societies at that time would have rendered obsolete a lot of activities that this plan focused on. Beyond all those aspects, it did not carry Nigerians along in terms of how to implement these plans. It was more, an, uh, more of a uh, Eurocentric idea that was foisted on Nigerians to accept as a development plan. And then that the critical aspect of having a complementarity and reciprocity between agriculture and industrialization was not captured in that arrangement. Its emphasis was basically on agriculture to the neglect of any effort at industrialization. So all these had these various challenges that necessitated subsequent uh, development uh, plans. The justification given was flexibility. Sorry, excuse me. Yes, the justification given was flexibility. Actually, 10 years was too long as a span given the state of statistical information or plan for a country like Nigeria. Other plans that emanated from these plans include development plan of 1955-1960. Remember that after the 1946-1956 plan that they interrupted in 1950 and divided it into two halves, that had a lot of crisis, the next development plan that followed was that from 1955 to 1960. The plan, even though the revised 1951-1956 plan was not due to come to an end until March 1st, 1956, it came to a premature end in 1955 as a result of the introduction of a federal system of government in the country. In 1954, since the new constitution 
constitutional arrangement made each of the regions autonomous. Each of the then regional government and the federal government launched its own five-year development plan for the period 1955-1960. Remember, like I said earlier on, that the Mahfaz's constitution structured Nigeria to pursue development built around regionalization. And we had three regions in existence as at that time, and the federal government as well. So after the first development plan that came to an end, within 1955 and 56, we now saw a 1955-1960 development plan that the various regions pursued and ensured that certain aspects were peculiar and were recognizable as landmarks or giant strides by these various regions. We heard of issues of free education in the Western region. We heard of issues of a boost in agriculture in other regions and even in the Eastern region and so many other places within the country. So after a series of review, the estimated total cost of the program was around 328 million. Remember, the first one had about 110 million as the budget for the development plan. But that this second development plan, this second development plan saw a higher budgetary arrangement with a broader scope and with a reflection of the various regional arrangements as the medium to pursue development within the country. So regionalism gained a lot of recognition under this arrangement. So one consequence of setting up such powerful autonomous regions was the existence of consideration overlapping in the plans of the various regions and the need to coordinate them at the national level. The idea built around it was premised on the fact that if these regions are allowed to pursue independent development, they would now compete among themselves and there will be rapid development of the country. So that was the idea that was embedded in, this, in these issues of regionalization and the pursuit of development on that basis. So in line with that, the National Economic Council, which was established in 1955, was the first major attempt to create a national institutional framework for planning. And this body was to provide a forum to discuss development policies and common economic problems. The National Economic Council, which was chaired initially by the Governor General and later by the Prime Minister, while the regional premiers and some federal and regional ministers were members, was intended to achieve the coordination and the decentralization of planning uh, had made which had which was made necessary it was stipulated that the council will be consultative in nature in which the government of the federation and the regions may meet to discuss the many economic problems common to each notwithstanding their separate constitutional functions and of consequences reaching beyond their respective constitutional spheres what this is trying to say is that in as much as the country was structured on regional lines that the central government would from time to time evaluate the various challenges or the various levels of progress made by these various regions in the overall interest of Nigeria. So in as much as to say regional arrangement, the central government also had a role to monitor and even help to guarantee that these various regions are doing well economically and are on the right track in the pursuit of development. The council uh, will provide a permanent basis for such consultations without, however, encroaching upon the authority entrusted by the constitution to the respective governments. So in as much as the government, the central government plays specific roles, it will not, do I say, encroach into the various powers of this region, but rather would see that each of this region is doing well. That is the structural arrangement that existed as at that time in the pursuit of development upon this regional arrangement. It is designed to give the maximum encroachment to the development of a national economic policy and to close cooperation towards that end between the government and the federation. One defect of the National Economic Council was that its deliberations were infrequent, meeting only 17 times in the 10 years of its existence, an average of about 1.5 uh, uh, meetings a year, and there were years too in which it did not meet. The mode of discourse at the National Economic Council meeting was said to be one of generalized debates, examination of policies, conscious of its relative weaknesses. NEC established the Joint Planning Committee in 1958 as its intellectual and technical arm, 
which was charged with the advisory task of formulating planning objectives and coordinating the planning proposals of the federal and regional government. This committee, chaired by the economic advisors to the prime minister, had official permanent secretaries of planning and, and the planning ministries of the government of the federation as members. His specific duties, among others, were to examine and report upon any matters permitted to it by the National Economic Council or individual governments. So you will see that the, this various uh, development plan and the structural arrangements embedded in it reflected an arrangement that is built around various positions, various calibers of persons, the governor general, the ministers of planning, the, the unofficial members of legislature and all that embedded in it. So it makes it a little difficult to comprehend. So the high points would be the point of interest that every student should focus on. What were they built around? What were their objectives? What were the levels of achievement? What were the criticism that greeted the development plans? So these are many more guided or further triggered the understanding that should be gotten within this development plan that existed in the country. So in line with that, we, we would focus a lot Sorry, I am just trying to get my internet uh, secured uh, by, uh, okay. So I'm having a lot of challenges with my network here. And that is why I am uh, paying a bit of attention to it to ensure that uh, it doesn't shut down. So in line with that, the idea is to ensure that there is even development in the country in as much as the idea of regionalism was meant to prepare speedy development in the country. So another high point is that to advise the National Economic Council in particular, by preparing a statement of fundamental objectives for the guidance of the planning committee of the several governments in the Federation of their development plans for each succeeding period. You remember the National Economic Development Plan had the issues of uh, not being efficient in terms of its monitoring uh, uh, principles of the various regional efforts at development. So they quickly came up with the, the issue of the Joint Planning Committee, JPC, and that this JPC would now monitor various aspects of the pursuit of development that existed within the country. So in line with that, they also came up with the idea of the 1962-1968 development plan. This plan, First was built post-independence. That is one of the high points of the plan, that it is post-independent and that it also reflected the Nigerianness that the earliest development plans did not uh, have. So this development plan to a large extent saw that it put in place the interest of Nigerians upon independence in the pursuit of development. The plan at this 10th meeting in 1959, the National Economic Council decided that a national plan, development plan, be prepared for the country. This decision gave birth to the 1962-1968 plan. Under the plan, a total investment expenditure of about 2.2 billion, 130 million was proposed. Remember, the first one was 110 million, second one was around 380 million. So this third development plan or post-independence development plan had a broader a scope better funding and reflected the interest of Nigeria. So those are the basic high points that one should look at when discussing this development plan. So out of this, the public sector investment was expected to be 1 billion 352 million, while the remaining investment expenditure of 780 million was expected to be undertaken by the private sector. The statement of national objectives expressed in the 1962-1968 plan appeared clear and articulate. This is the views of Okibo, 1989. These objectives were basically the achievement and maintenance of the highest possible rate of increase in the standard of living and the creation of the necessary conditions for this, including public support and awareness that will be required in concrete terms. This objective was translated to cover first a growth rate of the gross domestic product at 4% per annum. Secondly, savings ratio to be raised to 15% of the gross domestic uh, products. Let me pause here and 
direct your attention to the specifics of this development plan. First, it was described as being clear and articulate, and that its emphasis was improving the living standard of Nigerians. You can see that it is an improvement from the earliest development plan, in as much as the emphasis of those development plans targeted agriculture and to some extent industrialization, transportation, education. This is the first major development plan that now narrowed its scope to the betterment of the welfare needs of the individual. So its emphasis was on the living standard of Nigerians. Secondly, that the pursuit of uh, an improved or increased the gross domestic product was also put into consideration. The issues of improved per capita income was put into consideration. So it revolved around a welfare system that would improve the lots of Nigerians. So in line with that, there is an annual investment of 15% of gross domestic products, but acceptance by all governments that the highest priority should go to agriculture, industry, training of high level and intermediate manpower. So you can see that this appears to be a concise development plan that had its objectives clearly spelled out. So beyond the aspect of having a vibrant living and welfare condition for Nigerian citizens, it also put into consideration the issues of growth in agriculture, industrialization, and even the training of manpower that would propel these levels of development. However, they were not without shortcomings. The procedure for formulating these objectives was no more than an educated guesswork, as the planners did not have at their disposal the relevant information on the main parameters, such as consistent national income series, data on population growth, and its characteristics. So you can see that in as much as it was a laudable objective that characterized the development plan, it did not put into consideration the issue of a concise national income uh, uh, arrangement. So where would the income come from? Also, the issue of data on population growth was not put into consideration as well. So all these were some of the challenges that the development plan had. So for example, the, the rate of growth of 4% per annum was arrived at by using 1950 and 1957 data on national income to calculate the income for the base year 1962. And this was extrapolated to 1968. In the absence of such detailed information, the cost of decision could become prohibitive and the possibilities of inconsistent decision become greater and greater. So Scoop Stopper 1966 described the 1962 development plan as planning without facts. So you can see that the objectives were laudable. However, in terms of its practicability, there were loopholes that were not put into consideration. Nevertheless, the plan which came out in 1962 was considerable improvement over the 1955 to 1960 development uh, programs in many ways. First, all government had a uniform plan period that the various regional governments had a uniform plan period. Secondly, efforts were made to set and quantify according to the then Minister of Economic Development is a manifestation of the growing recognition of the need to work towards common ends. 1962 to 1968 plan document, page five, had this contained in it. In fact, the 1962 to 1968 plan was described as the first national plan. The plan was so described because it was the first post-independence plan. The previous ones having been formulated and executed during the colonial era with little participation, especially during the 10-year plan of development and welfare, Little participation by Nigerian nationals. It was even claimed that the 1960 plan rectified the defects of the previous development plans. Remember, like I said earlier on, this development plan is the first indigenous development plan that was put in place post independence. So, one of its major relevance or characteristics is premised on the fact that it showed the Nigerianization of various aspects of the development plan. Nigerians were put into consideration in the pursuit of this development plan. And that is why its first objectives, objective was to improve the living standard of Nigerians before it now delved into issues of agriculture, industrialization, and improved manpower arrangement that would see to the implementation of these various development plans. So it is the first national development plan that Nigerians participated effectively and was also and improvement in the earliest development plan with the colonialist sets in motion. So 
in line with that and following its own effort towards the attainment of its objective, we now saw the second development plan between 1970 and 1970. So the plan before the expiration of 1968 plan and just about the time that the preparation of the next plan was to commence, the country experienced a national crisis, that is the civil war of proportion, which seriously affected the operations of the planning institution. The National Economic Council and Joint Planning Committee ceased to function because of the crisis. They were both replaced by the National Economic Planning Advisory Group in 1960. One of the functions of this body was to review the progress of the, econo of the economy since independence. The advisory group was unable to function effectively in an environment that required a rigorous and constant interventionist policy by the government in the economic affairs of the nation. Let me pause here and uh, draw your attention to the fact that in as much as this 1962 to 1968 plan was the first national development plan post-independence, it had a lot of challenges that narrowed its achievements. And that major challenge was the civil war that happened in 1967 and 1970. So when this second national development plan came on board, its idea was to rebuild Nigeria, to see to a system that would promote unification of Nigeria and have a central objective that would now see to the rebuilding of the war-torn areas in Nigeria. So the Second National Development Plan 1970-1974 was formulated and implemented under a military regime, and it was launched shortly after the end of the civil war, with the aim of reconstructing the war battered economy and social development in the country. The preparation of the Second National Development Plan would have been finalized much earlier, but because of the civil war, the implementation of the First National Plan was extended to 1970. The experience and the lessons of war no doubt influenced the national philosophy, which served as the principal focus of the plan. This philosophy was spelled out in the objectives, which were to establish Nigeria as first, a united, strong, and self-reliant nation, a great and dynamic economy, a just and egalitarian society. So because of the challenges of the war situation that the country faced in Part of its objective was to see that a land of bright and full opportunities for all citizens existed, a free and democratic society. This was the first attempt to express the social philosophy underlying the country's planning efforts. The plan was much bigger in size. The total capital expenditure was about 4.9 billion than its predecessor. According to IO 1988, the second plan was more diversified in its project composition than the earliest plan. And it was, in fact, the first truly national and fully integrated plan which viewed the economy as an organic unit, the 12 states being fully integrated in the plan. However, Okigbo described the objectives of the 1970-1974 plan as general or what would be regarded as dynamic. There was no way to measure or assess whether the claim of a particular policy was valid with respect to making Nigeria great and dynamic. The inclusion of the objective of a free and democratic society uh, the constituted took the planners outside the realm of economics. The splitting of the country into 12 states in 1967 brought another dimension to the problem of planning. The machinery, which had been designed to formulate and coordinate national planning when there were five governments, became inadequate to withstand the demand of 13 governments, most of which lacked the relevant institutional machinery and manpower resources for economic planning. With the exception of, the, of perhaps the Western and Midwestern states, all other states were still relatively new for planning purposes during the 1970-1974 plan period. And this included the East Central states, which had just emerged from being the main theater of the Civil War. What emerged, therefore, was a clear recognition that the federal government must take the lead and coordinate the national efforts in formulating plans.
sorry, I had a bit of a, another round of network challenge. So, in line with all that has been said about the development plan, is sought the rebuilding of Nigeria after the war situation. So, in line with that, also. So beyond the second development plan, I'll try to be as swift as possible so that uh, we do not continue to experience these network uh, issues. Beyond this uh, second development plan, we had also the third development plan between 1975 and 1980. The dimension of the plan has it that it's an improvement on the second development plan. The view as also expressed in a different way concerning the third national development plan in 1980. The statement of the objectives merely provided a broad view of the ultimate aspiration of the society. The five cardinal objectives of the second national plan were modified and expanded into seven short terms for the third national plan. The first is increase in per capita income. Secondly, more even distribution of income. Third, reduction in the level of unemployment. Increase in supply of high level manpower. Diversification of the economy balanced development. So these are all part of the third national development plan. Like I have done it in this text now. You will find the high points of this development plan painted in red, and then the, the pitfalls or the criticisms painted in blue. So if you go through that, you will see the high point of each of these development plans, and you would understand them better. So the third national development plan was an improvement over the second plan in terms of definition of objectives, the overall strategy of the plan was to utilize the resources from oil to develop the productive capacity of the economy and thereby improve the standard of living of the people. The huge side of the plan was as a result of the optimism generated by the unusually favorable financial circumstances under which the country was operating at the eve of the plan. So the oil revenue at that time propelled so much development within that period of time and its budgetary allocation was very humongous owing to the fact that there was enough resources as at that time. Within that period is when we had the a festival of art and culture. We had Nigerians, uh, the Udoji Commission that, that paid so much salaries and benefits to civil servants and Nigeria was doing well within that period of time. However, it had its own challenges as well. And by March 1975, the country's oil production was at a record level of 2.3 million barrels per day why the price stood at $14 per barrel, having risen from $3 per barrel in 1973. Nigeria's oil production was projected to reach 3 million barrels per day by the end of the planned period. This was, however, not realized due to the prevailing world economic depression, which resulted in production and price decline to the extent that the estimated value of oil exports in the first year of the plan, 1975-1976, fell by about $1 billion. Apart from this, Barely two months after launching the plan, a number of other problems of disturbing proportion, which were not much in evidence at the time of the plan preparation, surfaced to pose a serious threat to the successful implementation of the plan. This included the effects of the growing congestion at the ports and the acceleration of inflation, which was not only distorting the plan priorities, but also eroding living standards all over the country. So in as much as that period had a lot of resources when this plan was made, shortly after the plan was made, he, re, he faced a lot of challenges that brought to, to a, a, a collapse of the major objectives which the plan was known for. So in line with that, in as much as had these challenges that the fall of the of, of levels of production, 
the, the global economic crisis of that time, a decline in the revenue expected to boost other aspects of the economy. It was said that with the change of government in July 1975, a reappraisal of some of national debt was undertaken. Consequently, the third plan was reviewed with more emphasis placed on those projects which had direct effect on the living standard of the common man. Sectors such as agriculture, health, housing, and water supply were therefore given more priority. For instance, the target number of hospital beds proposed earlier in the plan was raised from 82,000 to 120,000. The target number of housing units was raised to 200,000 as against 60,000 units. So you can see that in as much as the plan had a lot of uh, challenges in terms of its funding, he redefined its objectives. So beyond that, there was a 1981-1985 development plan. The plan objective towards the end of the military administration in 1979, the federal military government issued guidelines for the fourth national development plan. The five-year plan was not launched until January 1981. The reason for the delay was to enable the, the new civilian administration, which was installed on October 1st, 1979, to participate in the formulation of policies and programs of a development plan that it was to implement. The 1981-1985 plan uh, provided or had the budget of its two billion was therefore launched by a democratically elected government under a new constitution based on the presidential system of government. The plan was intended to further the progress of establishing a solid base for the long-term economic and social development of Nigeria. So beyond the third national development plan, the 1981-1985 development plan was the fourth development plan that the country witnessed. High priority was consequently accorded to agriculture, particularly food production, manufacturing, education, manpower development, and infrastructural facilities. Social services like housing, health, and water supply were also emphasized with a view to improving the quality of life in both urban and rural areas. So you can see the efforts that Nigeria made post-independence in the pursuit of development. So it is an attempt to transform the status of underdevelopment to a developed a, a, a situation where everybody can, can do well within the confines of the, of the country. We had these pitfalls as well, as can be seen in these blue paints here. Although the guidelines adopted in the outline for the 1981-1985 plan accepted almost the specific objectives of the third plan as still valid. It criticized the focus on growth in the previous plan as wrong and misconceived. It raised perhaps for the first time an appropriate tool far for the incoming civilian politically elected administration, the basic question, what kind of society did Nigeria wish to evolve and what was development? The guidelines proceeded to answer that true development must mean the development of man, the realization of his creative potentials, enabling him to improve his material condition of living through the use of resources available to him. It went further to articulate the need for self-reliance and concluded that a conscious effort be made to mobilize the masses the entire Nigerian population for the implementation of the fourth plan. The specific objectives of the plan were increase in average income of average citizens, increase in average income of average citizens, more even distribution of income among individuals and sociocultural groups, reduction in the level of unemployment and underemployment, increase in the supply of skilled manpower, reduction of dependence of the economy on a narrow range of activities, balanced development, that is achievement of a balance in the development agenda within the country. So all these were embedded in the fourth national development plan. That its emphasis was on an improved welfare system, an improved living condition, and an economy that would have its forward linkages that can propel industrialization and will guarantee a faster development of the country. So it focused on a kind of development that reflects the nature and character of our own society. So that is why it was uh, considered as one of the highest uh, development plans that Nigeria has witnessed in terms of its scope and objectives. Seven, increased participation by citizens in the ownership and management of the productive enterprise within the country. Greater self-reliance, that is increased dependence on local resources in seeking to achieve the various objectives of societies. This also implied greater effort to achieve the optimal utilization of Nigeria's human and material resources, development of technology, increased productivity, the production of a new national orientation conducive to greater discipline and better attitude to work and a cleaner environment. All these were embedded in the fourth national development plan. And to a large extent, it 
put Nigeria on the path of development in as much as there's still so much uh, to be desired. I am trying to, to rush and meet up because I think we have about five or six minutes left. And also the internet source is a bit uh, uh, troubling. So planning problems. So beyond these various plans that we have seen, we have also witnessed a lot of challenges in the planning processes within Nigeria and other sectors of the economy as well. Planning as a term implies the formulation of a strategy for the future. In economic balance, it may mean the assessment of one's resources at present and its allocation among different uses as to meet some specific goals in the future. For example, an individual might plan for secure income in his old age by allocating his income between present consumption and savings in various schemes, like taking an insurance policy or simply keeping his money in a bank. A business firm might also plan to double production in, say, two year time, in which case it has to decide how much resources it can raise internally, how much to borrow, what equipment to buy, etc. etc. What this is trying to say is that at every point in time, planning is a hallmark of both present arrangement and a forecast of the future. So the irrelevance of planning, be it at an individual level or within the broader society, is basically to attain specific goals and to guide against the challenges that may occur in line with these goals. So the notion has, the nation has to assess its resources and allocate these resources among different competing uses, depending on specific period priority of each use. The planning authority has to assess how much of these resources are available and how they are to be exploited and further developed for meeting the goals set for the economy. The time frame by which these goals are met also has to be fixed. Planning in a developing economy goes further to attempt to fulfill the objective of transforming the economy from a low level of production to a higher level of self-sustained growth. So you see the, that the idea of how to transform the loss of the society or efforts to transform the status of underdevelopment is built around deliberate efforts and deliberate planning processes for one to have a society that is modeled in line with the pursuit of development. And that is why we saw in the last class that Nigeria tried to use the civil service to pursue development and now these various development plans also are deliberate efforts put in place in the pursuit of development within the country. So, as can be seen in the various development plans, from 1946-1956, to 1960-1968, 1970-1974, 1975-1980, and 1981-1985, you would see that Various ideas were brought into bear in the pursuit of development with particular emphasis on having a self-reliant economy that has the interest of the people, the material well-being of the people, the living conditions of the people at heart. And that is what this statement is trying to say, that these various development plans, as carried out by the Nigerian government, fit into its pursuit of having a vibrant economic arrangement that would carry along the interest of all and sundry in the pursuit of development. Consequently, most of the projects submitted to the office by many of these state ministries and their agencies for inclusion in the plan were mere ideas lacking the necessary preliminary appraisal to establish not only their feasibility, but also their scope and estimated cost. So these plans have had various challenges across boards. However, they have set a standard or have laid the foundation for the pursuit of development. They have demonstrated the will and the capacity to put Nigeria on the pedestal of development. So they are also, I haven't said all that, the prospect for, the, for planning in Nigeria has it that in spite of all the problems highlighted in the course of this study, there are still prospects for using the planning process to achieve Nigeria's development objectives. As indicated earlier, except perhaps the National Planning Commission, which can be said to have some trained planning officers very few ministries and agencies at both the federal and state levels have officers with relevant training to undertake planning functions on a permanent basis. Planning duties have therefore been undertaken by administrative officers who are given ad hoc training prior to the commencement of plan preparations. So these are some of the challenges that the planning process in Nigeria has faced, that there is shortage of skilled manpower that are granted enough to implement development plan policies within the country. And that, to a large extent, has continued to be a bane in the development pursuit that Nigeria uh, continues to grapple with. 
So in summary, Nigeria's planning experience dates back to 1945 when the British colonial office requested the colonies to prepare development plans which would assist in disbursing the colonial development and welfare funds. In response to this request, the administration in Nigeria prepared a 10-year plan of development and welfare covering the period of 1946-1956, but this plan was written with criticism that necessitated the implementation and formulation of other plans. And we have seen through these various plans up until uh, the period which Nigeria uh, became stable or became known to have various development plans. In as much as there is more to be desired, we have seen within the conference of the Nigerian state that there have been various development plans that were deliberately put in place to pursue development. And they range from the first development plan that was in place by the colonialists that spanned across 10 year period of 1946-1956. We have seen the 1962-1968 development plan as well. We have seen the 1970-1974 development plan and other subsequent development plans up until the 1981-1985 development plan. And they targeted critical sectors that are drivers of development within, the, within every society. And they range from issues of first improved living standard of the people to agriculture and to the issues of industrialization, improved education, and a host of other attributes that if properly harnessed and combined for the purposes that they are to serve, every society can witness a transformation from an underdeveloped status to a developed one. So having said that, we will be pausing these lectures for now, and I hope to have your questions and contributions on the WhatsApp platform. So I'll be ending this class now, and then I await further contributions 